Hey everybody, I'm Tim Mooney with the Timothy Mooney Repertory Theater. Whenever you are ready for in-person events again, I am thrilled and delighted and ready and able and vaxxed and boosted to get out there and be with people again. Meanwhile, I've spent these two years developing an online style that creates a close analogy to the in-person offerings I've been presenting these past 20 years. This one, giving everybody a seat in the front row. I'm able to share these events at a tiny fraction of the usual cost, and you don't have to wait until I happen to be driving through your neighborhood. I'm available on demand and online at BrickneckShakespeare.com. You can rent a show, watch it as many times as you want over the course of a seven-day rental, or you can buy it outright and watch it with each new generation of students. Or you can subscribe Netflix style and watch all my shows, more being added every year, whenever you want. So here's a series of seven quick two-minute previews in the following order. Breakneck Hamlet, Breakneck Julius Caesar, Breakneck Comedy of Errors, Shakespeare's Histories, Moliere Than Thou, Man Cave, a one-man sci-fi climate change tragic comedy, Lot O Shakespeare. If one doesn't work for you, just jump two minutes ahead to the next. You can always book me through timmooneyrep.com or find these shows at breakneckshakespeare.com. Enjoy. about acting and spying. Time has passed. Hamlet seems to have convinced most everyone that he is under the grip of some form of madness. Scene one, a room in Polonius' house. Polonius sends a spy to France to snoop around and dig up dirt on his son's behavior while away. Ophelia reports a disturbing encounter with Hamlet, who burst in upon her, grasping her by the wrist and staring at her in a kind of a creepy way. Convinced that this is the very ecstasy of love, Polonius drags her off to see the king. Act two, scene two, a room in the castle. Claudius welcomes two of Hamlet's childhood companions, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, to Elsinore. Polonius arrives with the explanation to Hamlet's madness. But first, he must engage in an epic display of polonial long-windedness, winding his way around the answer for as long as humanly possible before finally presenting a letter that Hamlet has written to Ophelia. My liege and madam, to expostulate what majesty should be, what duty is, why day is day, night night, and time is time, were nothing but to waste night, day, and time. Therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit, and tediousness the limbs and outward flourishes, I will be brief. Your noble son is mad. Kings, senators, dictators. The Romans of 44 BC hated kings. The Romans ditched the notion of kingship for once and for all, becoming instead the great Roman Republic, governed by senators, mostly landowners, aristocrats, such as Brutus and Cassius, often slave owners, often every bit as corrupt as the former kings, they were at least corrupt over smaller chunks of the great empire. As we know, senators are mostly incompetent, generally incapable of agreement or leadership, and one might occasionally fantasize about life under a benevolent dictator. In Rome, it was not uncommon for a dictator to be appointed to temporary emergency terms of six months, perhaps several years, or in the case of Julius Caesar following four triumphant wars for life. People were generally okay with this just as long as the dictator did not become king. Why? because the kingship is inherited, not earned, and no one could guarantee that the son of a son of a son of a given king might not produce yet another tyrant to rule with ineptitude or insane bloodlust. Fifteen years prior to the start of this play, Julius Caesar had ruled as part of a triumvirate, formed in 60 BC in cooperation with the great general Pompey and a third, less celebrated partner, Crassus, who died in 53 BC. Keep in mind that in BC, time was traveling backwards, down towards zero, though of course, they had no way of knowing that at the time. Syracuse and Ephesus. Syracuse
Syracuse on the eastern shore of Sicily. That's the island that Italy's boot seems to be kicking. Ephesus on the western shore of what was then Asia. These two cities, 600 miles apart, are engaged in a trade war. Aguian is from Syracuse. You can tell he's from Syracuse by the S on his hat. He's not really wearing an S on his hat. That would be a dead giveaway. That's just there so that you guys have some hope of following the plot. He is arrested and brought before the Duke. In Syracuse was I born and wed unto a woman. With her I lived in joy. Our wealth increased by prosperous voyages I often made to Epidamnum. Epidamnum is on the western shore of Greece, roughly halfway between Syracuse and Ephesus, at least as the crow flies. During one of those voyages, Aguian's wife becomes great with child and follows her husband to Epidamnum, where she, amid the pleasing punishment that women bear, gives birth to twin boys. There had she not been long, but she became a joyful mother of two goodly sons, the one so like the other, as could not be distinguished but by names. Yes, those two baby sons were so much alike that they could not be distinguished but by names. So, what did Ian do? As if being a twin did not come with enough identity issues all by itself, he gave them both the same name. Again, conveniently neglects to mention that name here, largely because doing so would have destroyed the plot, but we later discover that name is Antiphilus. The year 1066. The Normans' conquest over England led by William the Conqueror. William begets William II and Henry I, who becomes father-in-law to Geoffrey of Anjou, the first known as a Plantagenet. Geoffrey fathers Henry II, who becomes king shortly after marrying Eleanor of Aquitaine, thus creating the Angevin Empire, encompassing not only England, but most of France as well. Henry is father to five sons. The most popular, Richard the Lionheart, rules from 1189 to 1199. When Richard dies in 1199 without an heir, succession might have gone one of two ways. It might have gone to Arthur, the 12-year-old son of Henry's fourth son, or it might pass directly directly to Henry's fifth and only surviving son, John. This is the issue at the center of all of Shakespeare's history plays, succession. In each instance, a good, clean, undisputed succession leads to happiness and prosperity. An uncertain, contentious succession leads to dispute, dissent, and rebellion. Given that Shakespeare's own monarch, the childless Queen Elizabeth, was now in her 60s, an ancient age at that time, Shakespeare was essentially telling horror stories about the dangers a disputed succession might bring to England of the 17th century. In the 13th century, however, issues of succession were not so clear or settled, and while the 12-year-old Arthur might have had the cleaner path, the 32-year-old John had all the power. If the name King John sounds familiar, he also appears in the many tales of Robin Hood, as well as Ivanhoe and the Lion in Winter, always depicted as somewhat of a weasel. I'm afraid I'm it for this evening's cast. The honor with which you endear me thusly is one which I would take quite seriously. Your soul will stay all pure and lily white, yet once you misstep here, however slight, it will become as black as any coal. And to think I've never studied, and yet I came up with that one right on the first go. Because one loves the glories of the Lord does not suggest his works ought be ignored. Of all the evils, no, by far the worst is when great lords with wickedness are cursed. The time was when the heart was on the left, with liver on the right. You are most deft, and yet we since have... Change that all around. You 
Poor Moliere's a disrespectful rogue, and he might think it suits the current vogue to ridicule our doctors in a play. And here's a matter straining all beliefs. You even pay for your attorney's briefs. Oh yes, that is the way to tell the crowd the beauty of a work both clear and loud. Such things are valued only in perspective of how the players make it more effective. My voice goes out and you'll hear it in what? 30 years? 3,000 or so? And then you'll talk back? And 60, 6,000 years from this tick, you'll talk to a very hot planet in your unique accent, in your own special diction. Of course, I won't be here. Nobody will. And you'll have learned English for no good reason. Unless maybe you manage to download some Shakespeare. But the planet itself won't be dead. Sure, the roads will all crumble, the buildings collapse, the plastic, that'll still be around. And maybe the last living things to survive will be cockroaches and some fungi. You might find yourself talking to some really fun guy. Sorry. It'll all go to shit for a time, but a thousand years more, maybe a million, the earth has a cleanse. It rains and it buries its carbon below once again, and the skyscrapers form some new form of bedrock, and the fun guys form life, or the lizards form brains, become Klingons, and then you'll have someone to talk to from here, except they'll speak Klingon. And it won't that much matter because they'll all have sprung from primordial ooze and won't retain even the tiniest fraction of the institutional memory I have with me now. You could, if you wanted, catch them up on things. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Lot O Shakespeare. One monologue from every Shakespeare play in alphabetical order. Are you meditating on virginity? Tis such fools as you makes the world full of ill-favored children. With the spleen of all the underfiends, he that sleeps feels not the toothache. The undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, but my love and your high majesty. For the fifth Harry from curbed license plucks the muzzle of restraint that fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day. See, they forsake me. And force per force, I'll make him yield the crown or hew my way out with a bloody axe. And as he plucked his cursed steel away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed it through thine eye on yon young boy. Then let fall your horrible pleasure to prick the sides of my intent. Say what you can, my false or ways your true. And it shall go hard, but I will better the instruction. Briefly, I do mean to make love to Ford's wife. When I said I would die a bachelor, I did not think I should live till I were married. Then to be drowned and go without her. And tell sad stories of the death of kings. Was ever woman in this humor wooed? Was ever woman in this humor won? Begot of nothing but vain fantasy. This is a way to kill a wife with kindness. Give me your hands if we be friends, and Robin shall restore amends. 
Hey, thanks for coming, everybody. Just a quick note about that last one you just saw. The original in-person Lot O Shakespeare can be 60 to 90 minutes long and is performed at random via the spin of a bingo cage. The audience each plays along, each with their own individual Iago card, and vies for the chance to win a t-shirt or a book. When you run it online, however, you get all of the monologues in alphabetical order, and you can just watch all of them or just the plays you're interested in. Collectively, it's almost two hours of fun with Shakespeare. Thanks again.